Josh from Multiversity here with Curtis Weave on this early, early Saturday morning. What's it like being at Comic-Con this early, sir? That's not bad. I, we were out a little bit late last night, but uh, I, I, I'm not drinking. I, I want to make this con a, a, a livable experience. So I was just out talking, hanging out with like Jim Zupkovich and uh, Joe Keating, and we we're just sitting around and having a good chat. So yeah, not too bad this morning, actually. So Intrepid's just wrapped uh, a little while ago, the first uh, story, and generally well received across the board. How has that been for you? Yeah, it was good. Um, I, right up to the end, like you know, we it was a smaller title. It didn't have like a, a, a huge following, but you know the reviews were actually really good up until the end. It was pretty cool. Uh, Daily Blam had followed it from issue one all the way to issue six and reviewed it, and they do like a five uh, exclamation mark rating. And the first issue got I think one and a half or two, and by the end he'd given us four and a half. So we we slowly raised him up to the back up to the to almost full. So it was cool. Like we. We, it was a slow start because it was my first comic, and uh, but once I started getting comfortable with the characters, and it just kind of came a little bit more naturally, and so it was much stronger by the end, I think. So can you speak a little bit about the evolution of that story? How long has it kind of been uh, percolating in your mind? Uh, Intrepid's Ice, man, I wrote that, I think it's two years ago now. Uh, so I always knew where the story was going to go. Uh, I knew the twist in the story, I knew kind of the character development and the character arcs, so I've, I've known it pretty well for a couple of years now. It was really satisfying to come to the end and at issue six where we just pulled out all the stops and had, you know, all the characters return and it was like a major action sequence pretty much for 20 pages of just action. It was really fun. I had a lot of fun with it. So working in independent comics is is always a uh, a gentle business in that you're pretty much building worlds uh, right from the start. But in your book, uh, the extent to which uh, the world building occurred was incredible. The the expansiveness, the backstory that you wrote into these characters' lives, it really felt like you were building something substantial. And I'm wondering how you went about developing things like the situation, the characters. Like how did you get uh, from the original spark of the idea? to the even the four characters that that uh, that inhabited the book uh, it mostly came about just some experiences I was going through and uh, one of the things that I didn't have it when I was writing it originally I it was just kind of a cast of misfit characters and uh, I kind of built their personalities just based on a few you know basic ideas and uh, I learned I was thinking a lot about family at the time and how people identify family I'm actually adopted so uh, I was going through some really weird things with like just my own personal that with my family but a relationship I was having and I was just thinking about what what's the nature of family and, and how do we actually define it is it like blood is it is it who we spend our time with and so that actually really affected how I developed the characters and a lot of people have said that you know these characters they're not actually related obviously but it really felt like a, a family there were a bunch of siblings that were working together in the story so yeah that's definitely where I was coming from when I developed it so how far along the line did Scott Kowalchuk come in to uh, start visualizing it uh, about a year after I wrote the script and then I met him about nine months later at his uh, art show he was doing for his graduation he went to ACAB and I met him there and uh, he did some work on a some art for a magazine that I was doing with a friend of mine and uh, he contributed a short story and I'm like I didn't actually know I couldn't visualize the characters or the story like, I had an idea of what they would look like but I could not for the life of me think of what art style would work with it and then one day I just looked at his art and I was like I, I wonder how he would interpret it so I sent him the script and I sent him the character uh, concepts and he the first thing he sent back was the cyber bear and uh, I was like, oh man, like it was so good, it was so retro, and that actually affected how I wrote the story after that. I changed a few things, and the story became way less dark. Originally, it was a little bit more gritty, and I just totally took that out of the story. There's a little bit there still, but it's, it's fairly lighthearted. His work is very, very indicative of early Jack Kirby, Will Eisner. Like the, like the Godfathers of comics was really, really reflected in his art, and is that something that... Obviously, you just mentioned that it's not really something that you intended for the book, but do you feel that ultimately it ended up being the right choice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it's funny because you, there's certain stories, like the first series I did, uh, Beautiful Creatures of the Red Five Comics, it's kind of a supernatural, a bit light-hearted comedy. Uh, and if, like, same with someone like Riley, I on I would do Green Wake with. If he had done it, it would be a totally different book, like totally different. And yeah, like Scott was the perfect choice for that book. I mean, it is what it is because of of his art. I mean, the script was its own thing, but he he made it visually. He made it kind of trademarked it. What the Trepids look like, what their what their world is like. That's that's he did that. So for sure.
So you mentioned that you brought a lot of your own personal experience into Intrepid's. Moving over to Green Wake, uh, is the world building accomplished in a similar way in that book? Yeah, I was going through some really nasty at the time. I think that's what all writers go through, isn't it? It's it's some awful pain that you go through, and you have to tell it somehow. And yeah, it was it was based on some things I was going through. It was around the same time as Intrepid's actually. And uh, so the first arc is is all focuses on the on the aspects of loss and um, kind of sadness and guilt. As guilt is a is a big theme in the story and how people deal with guilt. And, and uh, so yeah, it was it was I was thinking a lot about how relationships affect you know our our thinking is about guilt and how we how we act because of our own guilt about how we have treated others or others have treated us. So yeah, it was definitely infused in some of my own experiences. Kind of drawing from the uh, same book as all of rock music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Uh, how did you feel when you found out that uh, Greenwake initially solicited as a five-issue miniseries now bumped up to an ongoing series? What was that like for you as a writer? Oh, it was good. Like. It it was we Riley and I had actually talked about you know if it does well do we have you know can we extend the story and uh, it was actually a pretty natural tra transition. The, a lot of people have asked me, did the story change after you found out it was going to be an ongoing series? And it actually didn't. The first five issues ended exactly as the book would have ended. What we're able to do with it now is all the mysteries and stuff that are, are kind of ambiguous in the story, we can actually answer those, those questions now. And uh, Jim Valentino Shadowline, the guy who runs Shadowline, uh, he asked us after, right after I think issue two came out, and the reviews were really good. He just said, "Hey, would you be interested in doing more?" And uh, so Riley and I sat down and we talked, and we're like, "Yeah, we, like we want to do it." And nothing really has to change. We can still do the first volume exactly as we had planned, and then we have little things that we can add right at the end just to make it, you know, jump onto the new series. So it was exciting, and we have, man, we've we've got so much planned for it. We, you know, we we were hoping we'd be able to answer a lot of the questions, like what's with all the frogs? That's the main question we get. What's with all the frogs? Like we have all the answers. I was just talking to a fan who came for a signing, and I told him like every single mystery that we've put in the first arc will be answered. Everything. So how long, now that the book has been uh, given an extended stay, how long are you plotting it out for? About 25 issues total. So we're talking about four more arcs of uh, five issues. And we're kind of restructuring our, our scheduling. Uh, Riley is hes busy and he's, he's becoming more in demand. So he's wanting to try a few other things, but he doesn't want to give up Green Wake. So we're going to do five months on. We're going to take a five-month break. We're going to fill that, that space without Green Wake with content. We're going to get the trade out in the middle of that five-month break, and then we're going to get one-shots from uh, other artists and other writers. Uh, just to kind of, you know, so there's not so much time in between the, each arc. So, yeah. That seems really effective in kind of stretching out your brand a little bit. Like, I see your, your T-shirt. It's definitely something you guys are, are investing in. You can buy this online, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. So, uh, moving past Greenwake a little bit, you have a couple projects coming up, starting with uh, Peter Panzerfaust, which I think you said is uh, launching in February? Uh, it, comes out, it comes out in February. It's through Shadowline as well, and it is an ongoing series right out the gate. So, uh, it's going to be, my plan is roughly the same for Peter Panzerfaust, and the way I'm pitching it is, it's Red Dawn meets Peter Pan. So it's basically about, it's set in World War II, it's about a bunch of French orphans that team up with this American boy named Peter and uh, they are fighting Germans uh, and they're joining the French resistance and they're fighting in Paris. And uh, so I'm infusing the Peter Pan mythology into this World War II story in really creative ways. One of the examples that I can give is uh, Captain Hook who in the, in the original mythology is scared of a crocodile and he loses his arm because the crocodile bites it off. So in this mythology there's a, a World War II tank called the crocodile and it was like a flame throwing tank and so that's how he loses his arm. And So like things like that we're going to infuse with it. And we actually have a face fan page and Tyler has done uh, a mock-up of the SS officer that is the Captain Hook character. It's awesome. So just go to Peter Panzerfaust on the Facebook. It's awesome. It's so cool. And you also have the Grim Leaper in, uh, in development. What can you tell us about that? Uh, Grim Leaper, I'm looking at a spring release for that. It's with a Brazilian artist. He's fairly new. He's amazing. His name's Alicio Santos. And uh, it is Final Destination uh, meets Quantum Leap. And it's, it's a black romantic comedy. It's about this guy that has a curse and 
he dies in really gruesome, horrific, and hopefully original ways. And uh, he wakes up in the body of another person, and he seems to be in this curse where he can't seem to figure out why it's happening. And one day he meets a girl who has the exact same curse, and so they're dating while this is going on. They're being horribly killed and reanimated in somebody else's body, but they're dating. And so, yeah, that's what it's about. So that comes out hopefully in March, I believe. That's fantastic. So is there anything else that uh, you'd like to pitch coming up? Is this, uh, will we be seeing more of the Intrepids? Uh, Scott is with Oni right now, and I know they've got him booked up for probably at least a year. So probably won't be any more Intrepids anytime soon. I do have another series coming out probably late sometime in 2012 called Goblinettes. And that is going to be with Image as well, and it's with Owen Gianni. He's been working on Evangeline with uh, Mark Poulton. And uh, so we're putting that pitch together right now. And Goblinettes is basically Lord of the Rings meets Josie and the Pussycats. It's about a goblin punk band. And goblins are all evil, robbing, stealing uh, creatures, but they're a punk band. So it's a girl band that sings about love. And uh, it's, a, it's a reverse kind of damsel in distress. She fi uh, meets this fan who's like loves her music. And they go on their first date. And uh, he gets captured by the goblin police. And it's her quest to go save him. So it's a reverse damsel in distress story. That's really fantastic. I've been thinking as, as we've been talking, you have not been involved in the industry very long. You're, you're a fairly fresh face. And now you have two books out and three more on the way. How do you generate ideas, especially that quickly? Uh, these are things I've been thinking about for years. Uh, I've got a hard drive just full of stuff that, that was, that's been ready for a while. And I just, you know, now that I have an opening, it's a little bit easier for me to pitch these projects. And it's easier for me to get artists attached that are, you know, really good and really excited. So these are projects that I've known for about two or three years that I've been brewing. And so, I, I mean, I still have lots more ideas. Um, I actually, I have a, a bit of Marvel work. I'm doing, uh, it's, they do a holiday annual. So I, it's my first Marvel work. I have a, an eight page story in there and it's basically like uh, <laughs> Wolverine and the X-Men go play some hockey but I use a lot of Canadianisms in it I infuse a lot of ca uh, Canadian icons in it and so a lot of Canadians will get it it might be totally lost on the American crowd but that's alright <laughs> I'm sure I'll appreciate it oh, that's good. That's good. well uh, it's been great talking to you thank you very much all right, thanks for your time